Welcome back to Viewpoint. We're reporting on the ideas championed at the Pro-Life Movement's conference, which comes ahead of the abortion referendum in March. Keynote speaker Baroness Nula Olone said there's no obligation on the government of Gibraltar to introduce abortion based on the 2018 Supreme Court judgment in England and Wales. Baroness Olone, thanks a lot for your time. Here in Gibraltar, as part of a Gibraltar pro-life movement, yes. um, or to contribute to a pro-life movement event, mm -hmm. how did that relationship come about? Uh, I was asked by the uh, people involved in the Gibraltar pro-life movement because I'm known in the United Kingdom for my activities um, in terms of uh, abortion, assisted dying or assisted suicide, and freedom of conscience for medical practitioners. I've done a lot of work in the House of Lords, I'm a member of the House of Lords, and I've done a lot of work there on the legislation, draft legislation. And uh, I come from Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland was, to some, seems to some degree, to have been a, a catalyst for the passing of the bill here in Gibraltar. Though I think I have to say to you that there seems to have been a very serious misunderstanding uh, about what happened in the United Kingdom. I suppose, you know, for me, coming here, looking at the bill, which is, it, it gives a very, very wide access to abortion, like almost, almost abortion on demand, um, if you look at it very carefully. Um, I'll, I'll pick you up on that in a moment, yeah, but I'll let you yeah, continue. Yeah. So, so looking at the bill and looking at the, you know, the suggestion that, for example, um, Northern Ireland had to legislate Therefore, um, Gibraltar has to legislate. Well, it's, it's legal that's not right. So the first thing is, Northern Ireland didn't have to legislate, and the government didn't move to legislate. And although we had two court decisions which considered the issue of whether our abortion law was compatible with European human rights law, neither the Supreme Court nor the High Court said that it was incompatible. So there's no declaration of incompatibility, so there's no obligation to legislate. Legislation was passed for Northern Ireland, but very, very broad framework legislation. Um, and it seems that the, the Gibraltar government misunderstood the impact of what had happened in the Supreme Court. Because the United Kingdom was under no obligation to pass law, um, you see, the situation is the Supreme Court makes its judgments, but Parliament is sovereign. Parliament decides what Parliament wants to legislate for. And even though the Supreme Court says, for example, we don't like the way the law is, that doesn't mean that Parliament has to change it. And there are many instances when Parliament has said, yes, we accept what you say, but we are not changing the law. So the government did not move to change the law in Northern Ireland. And yet, it seems that the government of Gibraltar seemed to think they had to do this, and I really don't understand that. Okay, so let's, um, let's remind our viewers what the Chief Minister Fabian Picardo has said uh, about the decision mm -hmm. of the Supreme Court in respect of the law in Northern Ireland. He said it means that we, Gibraltar, must now act to ensure compatibility of our laws with the European Convention right uh, of respect for privacy and family life, and more directly, our own Gibraltar constitution. Our current law is therefore likely no longer constitutional. Mm -hmm. You disagree with his yeah. position? I mean, I'm, I, I wouldn't claim to be any sort of an expert on the law of Gibraltar. What I can say is that there's no declaration of incompatibility. Therefore, you can't assume that your law is incompatible either. Right, so that's the first thing. The second thing is there's no obligation to act where the Supreme Court has made a decision. The third thing is that um, the Gibraltar, as I understand it, is a sovereign state. It is for the people of Gibraltar to decide what they want to happen. Anything else is, is to the detriment of the democracy of the people of Gibraltar. You know, Gibraltar is known for its resilience and its strength. And its people have, have this extraordinary capacity, I think, to survive a lot of very, very difficult circumstances. And it's for that reason that it is for the people of Gibraltar to decide. The, the, whatever the Supreme Court said is not relevant for the people of Gibraltar. It is for the people of Gibraltar to say to, to themselves, do we want abortion? Do we want this law? 
which says that you can have an abortion up to 12 weeks on the grounds of the mental and physical health of the mother, but you can have an abortion to birth. And the people of Gibraltar have to decide, do we want babies in the womb, seven, eight, nine months, do we want those babies to be aborted? Because there's a risk to the future health of the woman in the context of her reasonably foreseeable environment. It's so broad and so vague. Before we get into uh, any mm. more detail about the specifics mm. of the law, if we talk about the mechanics for, for a little mm. bit longer, um, the, let's say that, uh, that the UK government took the view that Gibraltar's law um, was unconstitutional, according to its own constitution, not compatible with the European Convention mm. right of respect for privacy and family mm. life, and started leaning on Gibraltar. The UK government maintains the uh, the power to be able to change the law in Gibraltar. Doesn't do so, but it retains the power to do so. Mm. Wouldn't that be the worst possible case scenario for Gibraltar to not change its law, but then have the law changed for it by the UK government? I do not believe that the UK government would move in that way to inflict on the people of Gibraltar a law which and I don't know what the outcome of this referendum may be, but I do know that a lot of people here are very uneasy about what's proposed. So I do not think that the British government will do that. I don't think it's in their interest. Gibraltar is a key strategic location for the United Kingdom. We know that. With Brexit coming, the government are very much preoccupied anyway. On, and, and there are uncertainties here, because I've asked people here what's going to happen after Brexit. And... Nobody seems to know, so there's a huge amount to be done. I do not believe the government of the United Kingdom would interfere with the sovereignty of the people of Gibraltar. I just don't believe that would happen. Um, <clears throat> and I think the people of Gibraltar have the right to say, not in my name, you will not do this to us. And I think that they, they can say that, and I very much hope that they will say that. Okay, so um, in your, from your perspective, you don't think there should be any exception for the circumstances of the mother that would allow a lawful abortion. But there are exceptions. It, I mean, my understanding of Gibraltar law is that there are currently exceptions, that in the situation in which a, a woman's life is at risk, of course, of course you operate to save the life of the mother and hopefully the child. But if you can't save the life of the child, then you save the life of the mother. So there are exceptions. It's not a complete blanket ban on abortion, and every civilised country accepts that. Um, so it's this extension of the availability of abortion um, without considering all the consequences of it. I suppose for me, you know, the European Court of Human Rights has never said that the unborn child does not have a right to life. The European Convention on the Rights of a Child to which all our states are signatory, the European Convention says that the child in the womb must be protected. So that is our legal <coughs> obligation, to protect the life of the child in the womb and then afterwards. So I think it's very clear there's no, no legal definition that says that the child has no right to life. The courts have always said that it's for individual countries to make their own decisions. There was no obligation to legislate in Northern Ireland. There is no obligation, as I see it, to legislate in Gibraltar. Therefore, this to me is precipitate, vague, undesirable, not the right way forward. So um, you accept that uh, where the mother's life is at risk, those circumstances are appropriate for yeah. a, an abortion to be considered yeah. if the child's life cannot be, or the baby's li life cannot be um, protected, yeah. saved? If there's a threat um, to the mother's if, life, sure. yes. What, what about, are there no mental health, uh, is there no uh, picture uh, in which mental health provides sufficient grounds uh, for an abortion to be termed the best course um, and lawful? I don't think so. I think the problem with mental health is that people make decisions on the basis of very little knowledge. I think, for example, one of the most famous cases in Ireland was the case of Miss C. Miss C was raped by a friend of her family and she became pregnant. 
and um, she was forced to go to England to have an abortion. She was, I think, 14 years old, something like that. She was forced to have an abortion. She has said since that the abortion was worse than the rape. And yet people were making the decision that this was the right thing for her. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, I, I don't think so. And I think the number of cases in which you have either rape or incest or fatal fetal abnormality, which is an indefined <laughs> medical term, um, all that is so, A, it's very rare, 99 point something percent of abortions in England and Wales are not carried out on those grounds. So in a population of, what's the population here, 30,000 mm -hmm. or something? In a population of 30,000, how many of those cases are you going to have? And why would you make a law which makes abortion widely ex accessible, almost on demand, I think, um, when the problem is, if there is a problem, it's so limited and you don't know the answers to it? There's been very little research done on the impact of abortion on women, and there's been very little work done on the impact of abortion on rape victims and people like that. So I think, you know, our, our suppositions about mental health are often not informed in the way in which they should be. But, but it, it's not our suppositions, isn't it? It would be a mental health professional, a, a doctor... A, the legislation doesn't say it has to be a mental health professional. Well, uh, um, one assumes that if, if we're talking about mental health being used as a, a, a reason uh, to allow a medical, what would be a medical procedure from, uh, from the law's mm. perspective, that it would be a medical professional to carry mm. out that a medical mental health assessment. A medical professional is very difficult from a mental health... You know, a psychiatrist is... Psychiatry is a specialism. Um, obstetrics and gynaecology is a specialism. The, the obstetrician is not qualified uh, to make those fine decisions about the mental health of a person. I mean, if you talk, for example, to one of my, my colleagues in the House of Lords, Baroness Hollins, who was a former chair of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, she will tell you that you do need specialist advice. And indeed, the Irish legislation provides for okay, so, a psychiatrist. So in the event that the legislation were to include a specific reference to uh, the, the right professional from, from your perspective, would that change things? No. No, it wouldn't, because I think that what you have here is, is an attempt to introduce abortion. And we know that the campaign, it's an international campaign to spread abortion across the world. We know that Northern Ireland, Gibraltar, and Malta are the three countries which are not, do not have ready access to abortion. We know that Ireland went after the um, referendum. We know that they stood in the grounds of Dublin Castle and said Northern Ireland next. And then they took their opportunity. It wasn't a government initiative to introduce abortion in Northern Ireland. It was a, an opportunistic action by members of the House of Commons. Um, they have come to Gibraltar and they will move to introduce abortion in Gibraltar to put pressure on people to make them understand that they must do this and then they will go to Malta. So, so uh, you, what you're saying is that this is orchestrated by a group of activists? A, a very large group of activists, yeah. Do we know some of the names of these activists? No. We don't know. Well, th that is not a matter I'm prepared to discuss. I mean, there are people but who... But you're saying that people are coordinating this? I mean, Yeah, who? yeah. I mean, if you look at International Planned Par Parenthood and those big organisations, they are coordinating, they are funding a lot of this work. So I have no doubt that it's coordinated. And when you see people standing after one success in one country and saying, this country next, this country next, yes, of course it's coordinated. And they make themselves available to go to different countries, to go to Kenya and places like that, to make the case for abortion. The uh, case uh, sorry, Baroness, what's different to, to you being a champion for um, a, a different perspective? <laughs> It's, uh, they have the rights. They have the absolute right of freedom of expression. What is being denied now is the right of the freedom of expression to say, these are the realities. When we're dealing with abortion, we're not dealing with a woman's right to autonomy. We're dealing with two patients, a baby who is sentient, who is breathing, who has life from the very beginning by virtue of the fusion of the, the, the sperm and the ovum. So we have two patients and you make a decision that the life of one patient is of no consequence. That's what happens in abortion, and you terminate that life. And if you can terminate it medically, and probably 90% of abortions are terminated medically now, you do so. But that doesn't mean it's a nice clean business. You know, people think you take the tablets 
two or three tablets and that's it. It's not. Abortion is a messy, messy business. In Ireland, the advice is when you've taken your tablets, you take the product, the baby, you wrap it in tissue paper and you flush it down the toilet or you dispose of it as you wish to dispose of it. This really is a baby. Even at 12 weeks, it is really identifiably a baby. So you have to put the baby back into the equation and you have to ask the people of Gibraltar, is this what you want? Is this what you as a sovereign people want? And from your perspective then, it's killing? Yes, of course it's killing. If How? you have life and you terminate, it's killing. How should perpetrators be punished from your perspective? Perpetrators for? That we know at present that there are women who are crossing into Spain to um, gain access to abortions, um, even though the uh, health care is otherwise in Gibraltar. Um, those women are, from your perspective, killing. Should they be punished? No. And how? No, I don't think they should be punished. I think that there are many things which people do which are against the law, which are not criminal acts. There's a limited, sorry, limited number of criminal acts. And I do not think that you make anyone's case any better by criminalising the woman. So I would not criminalise the woman. So the law in Gibraltar has criminalised uh, abortion. Um, and until this new law take a, takes effect, or, or a different mm. law if the referendum mm. is successful from your mm. perspective, uh, changes the law a different way, until such a time, mm -hmm. um, abortion is, punish, is punishable. No, it's not, because they don't, they don't, it's not used, is it? But Tell me jury, the last time it was used. No, no, but, but in law it is punishable. In law it's punishable, but it's not used. And I think that's a very sensible, if you like, accommodation. Um, I don't think it helps to punish a woman for, doing, for having an abortion. So should it be decriminalised then, formally? No, in law? I don't think it should, because I think the criminalisation of it because it's not just a criminalisation, if you like, of the woman who could be prosecuted but isn't. It's also those who provide the abortion. Should they be punished? Yes. If they act illegally, yes, they should. How would you punish? And you need, you send them to prison, you need to uh, protect, for example, we know that girls in England are forced into abortion because they're carrying girl children, very often girl children. Um, there are many cultures which uh, place greater emphasis and want boy children more than they want girl children. So if you're only going to have one or two children, it's better you have a boy child. So a, a very, very significant number of abortions are carried out on the basis of the sex of the child. That's illegal, but that's happening. If a girl is forced or coerced into abortion, there will be no protection for her if you decriminalise it. So, for example, in England, in the last couple of years, people have been prosecuted and convicted and sent to prison for putting tablets into their pregnant partner's um, food so that she aborts the child. They don't want the child, so they make her abort it. She doesn't even know what's happening to her. Women need to be protected against that. And they need to be protected against family pressures not to have a child and the child they're carrying is a child they want. So you need to have a criminal law process. F final thoughts for somebody watching this interview. Mm. Um, um, what would your message be to them? Uh, we, we've got a referendum a couple of months away now. Mm. What would your headline message be to them? Well, my headline message would be this referendum is about a subject which is not necessary. Gibraltar does not have to legislate on this area. There is absolutely no obligation on the people of Gibraltar to have this kind of abortion law, any kind of abortion law beyond that which exists already. The second thing is Gibraltar is a sovereign state and the people of Gibraltar should make up their minds about what they want their law to be and I think that's profoundly important. That's what we call democracy. It is not for the people of the United Kingdom to impose on the people of Gibraltar any particular form of law. So I think those are the two important things. One is it's not necessary, and I know that it is, is suggested that it has to be done. It does not have to be done. There is no obligation. The Supreme Court has no jurisdiction here, so they don't have to comply with, with rulings of the Supreme Court. And Parliament, to which I belong, Parliament does not always do what the Supreme Court suggests it should do. Parliament makes its own decisions and I believe that the people of Gibraltar should make their own decisions.